Thank you for joining our short series of conversations titled, What Do We Do If They Want To Be Happy? And I'll start by introducing the team behind the production of the exhibition and publication. My name is Irene Chin. I'm a curatorial coordinator here at the CCA. My name is Jacqueline Meyer. I am a curatorial researcher at the CCA. Uh, and my name is Claire Lubell, and I'm an editor at the CCA. So we're so glad to have you all with us. Can we do uh, your? Can you introduce yourselves and the office that you're um, joining us from, and maybe how long you've been with Gale Architects? My name's Blaine Blaine Merker. I'm uh, here in the San Francisco office. I've been with Gale since 2014. And what's your role in the office? We're curious. I'm know. a partner and managing director here in San Francisco. Okay. Hi, I'm Anna Musig. I'm an associate here at Gale, and I've been here since we started the office in San Francisco in 2014. Yeah, hi, my name is Mayra Madrid. I'm a director and team lead for this office in San Francisco, and I've been with Gale since 2014, also from the very start. Okay, hi, my name is David Sim. I'm creative director at Gale. I've been at Gale for 17 or 18 years. Um, I'm a former student of Young Gale. Um, I'm based at the office in Copenhagen. And right now, I'm in Amsterdam Airport. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julia Day in our Gale New York office. I'm an associate and team lead of the office here and have been with Gale also since the open offices in the US in 2014. Great, thank you. We're so glad to be able to connect with you all today and expand on some of the topics we explored through the project. So Our Happy Life was a research in the form of an exhibition using a narrative method we focused on the past decade, exploring politics, policy, data collection, and individual stories um, to, dissect, to dissect how in both direct and indirect ways the so-called happiness agenda has influ influenced the built environment. And the exhibition was really a tool for us to work through some questions and produce new ones, including how do we design our cities in an age when our feelings are constantly tracked and emotions become the basis of a new mode of production? How do we conceive space in a moment in which language we use to evaluate place has less to do with architectural typologies or physical proportions, but rather with moods and affects? In what ways is design practice shaped by the proliferation of happiness reports and well-being indices? So while it was a curatorial point to not directly um, engage architects and designers in our narrative, this series of conversations um, is conceived as a second phase and a complement to the show. Um, we've spoken to Rainer de Graaf, Bruter, Dirk Summers, and we're really glad to have Gale Architects, um, everyone here with us today. Uh, if the show was about observing side effects of a new ideology of happiness, we would like to pose some questions to you to talk about how you feel in practice you may or may not confront this new rhetoric. Okay, so I'm going to start with the questions, um, roughly in the same order that we sent them to you. Um, and so let's start with uh, happiness versus livability or well-being um, as a term or an objective um, when talking about urbanism in the city. I guess it's a really interesting question. Um, obviously, I'm based in Copenhagen, yeah. which is considered to be one of the most livable cities in the world. And at the same time, the Danes are supposed to be the happiest, or one of the happiest nations in the world. And it's interesting, like, what's the connection there? I mean, it's a might sound quite surprising in a way, because I guess in a world that you kind of imagine maybe the Scandinavians to be a bit miserable, <laughs> like, kind of, they've got nasty weather, they pay the highest taxes in the world. So, you know, I think there's kind of like a very interesting question, like, why? why why are these the Danes and why the Scandinavians, the Nordics in general, so happy? And I think there is a strong connection with a good everyday life. That actually, and that is the kind of stuff I guess, you know, you know like what you ask your grandma, well, what, what makes you happy? And it's generally like, um, you know, the best things in life are free, you know, follow your heart. I mean, there are things which allow you to live a very good everyday life. And so I, I guess there's going to be a different side, and I think this may be an update of discussion. I guess there's not so much dream in Scandinavia. It's very much about like 
reality and taking reality as it is. I guess we see lots of pragmatic things which make riding your bike, uh, daycare, um, um, getting around town, getting on the bus, really banal stuff is done really, really well. And to sum out of that, people maybe find space to be themselves. But I think it's a bigger thing. I think what's interesting, um, I guess I'm a kind of Lutheran, Northerner kind of, so it all kind of makes sense to me. But I guess it's interesting to bring my colleagues, who kind of are bridgers, and I think especially my colleagues uh, both in New York and San Francisco, they're really bridgers culturally because they've spent time in Copenhagen. They've got this Danish, this Danish message, this Danish uh, gospel. And I'd be really there to speak here for my colleagues what they say about how they take this, um, the joy of the everyday, the art of everyday life, how that, how that transcends to, to another culture, and to, to especially to North America, which is maybe the most different place to Scandinavia there is. <laughs> so maybe Yulia should uh, be the first to respond to this. <laughs> Sure, yeah, well, it's a little bit of a segue from the question you posed, but I mean, I would say in New York, right, which New York City itself has more people than the whole country of Denmark. So when we, you know, I think when we look to Copenhagen um, as a best practice, it's really important for us to figure out what, what from their approach to city making and to really understanding how people behave uh, can we take to other cities like New York or there are others in North America and not you know, ever try to suggest that we are trying to create Copenhagen in another city because there isn't an apples to apples comparison and there shouldn't be. Uh, but what we really can learn from this focus on livability and happiness is that to, you know, to get there you have to understand and really focus on measuring what you care about, as we say at Gale, and for us, that's people, and that's understanding where people are, what they do, how they move, how they would like to, and and using that to really drive uh, city-making decisions around design and policy. I think I have something I would like to add to that conversation about the, the terminology, and you have these three terms, happiness, livability, or well-being, and this I think there are two questions. One, how do I feel about those terms? And then how do I think the general public reacts to them? And I think there's something categorically different between the term happiness than livability or well-being. And it's that we are used, I think there's a tradition to understand the role of institutions and government and the state of caring for well-being, livability. I think those are aspects typically associated with infrastructure, with school, with the provisions that you expect from the state. Happiness has, had mo has much more to do with the personal, psychological, internal uh, components. And while I like it, I, I do like the use of the term happiness because it gets us closer to the goal that we're trying to aim our actions towards. I think there's se some segments of the general public that react with a little bit of distrust to the use of a word that is so intimate and so personal and to see a government agenda uh, trying to influence something that is so close to to your private realm, mm -hmm. it can cause a little bit of, of distrust or, or concern because like, no, 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 you, you worry about your part, happiness, that's what I do with my family. So, so I think they're, they're until people get used to, to seeing institutions using that terminology, we have to be careful with how it's perceived by the public. I think it's interesting a question that you posed, David, around happiness and how it transposes from you know being applied so well in the Denmark context to the United States because happiness is such an American idea. It's so personal. We, here we are on the West Coast. We just want to be happy inside our own experience. And I think something that we misinterpret in the United States too often is that happiness for me doesn't necessarily mean happiness for my community. And that's, they have a relationship to each other. And something that Denmark has really figured out is how to create a sense of happiness for the individual that also is the best for our society. Yeah, so I think before you come in, like, I think this is really interesting where it's going. I'm just noticing that there's a kind of a big difference. Like, I guess in the Nordics, um, in the welfare states, you kind of like the idea that our government wants to make us happy. 
And there's also that's maybe a fundamental relationship to government and governance, which really comes down to trust. And that's why I mean the Danes who are the happiest people pay the most taxes, which sounds maybe in North America, but it's really 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 crazy. Um, and I guess there's also like um, I don't know if it's religion or if it's something deeply Lutheran, and I guess the US is a much more uh, polyreligious kind of society in terms of many more uh, inputs. But I think the connections between happiness and work mm-hmm. is also actually very much rooted in the north of Europe, and that you find happiness through working hard. And so our idea of happiness, but just being what happiness means, it's not like joy living naked on the beach in California, it's actually more about doing the right thing and kind of like living a dignified life and uh, losing as little resources as possible. I mean, it's it's maybe a fundamentally different notion of what happiness means. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no. You, I think you, you picked up what I, what I was going to say, which is I think that the Nordic, what, what I experience as a North American in the, in the Nordic countries and seeing it is this difference between the sort of bright, shiny object of, of you know, happiness as being this kind of peak experience and the baseline of belonging and fitting in and all the different parts of society and different stages of life and the banal and the extraordinary sort of working together in, in, a, in a way in a Nordic context that's, I think, I think we do have something to learn from. Um, and, you know, we, we so favor this kind of peak notion of happiness here over the everyday, which there's actually quite a bit more of. There's quite a bit more of the everyday stuff, which may not kind of be this, like, you know... Um, endorphin rush, but there's something deeply satisfying about being able to do everyday things well and feel like you have a place to be yourself. So to me, that's kind of a, I think that's kind of a flavor that we're missing maybe in North America that we could, we could mm. add to the, to the dish. Yeah. So speaking of, uh, you know, multiple definitions or interpretations of happiness, um, in the exhibition and in the book, um, we identify or sort of construct um, uh, the happiness agenda. Um, and I'm wondering if that's something that you recognize um, or have had any interaction with um, as a practice. Well, we, I say, I'll say from sort of in, in the market of, of work that we do, we certainly see it out there as a, as a, uh, as a language, as something that's... Um, become a commercial a commercial practice actually in analyzing happiness and and um, kind of using that using that language to to land the goals of of uh, cities um, I, I think you know like in, in reading some of the background materials you sent there's there's certainly this merito- this sort of competitive meritocracy that's developing between cities where they're competing on a pretty f- you know they're competing on indices they're competing on a flattening of pretty complex human experiences and uh, and and the the complexity of how society is arranged kind of boiled down to one number which is in itself is problematic and so I think we would say that's that's interesting you know you might want to look at several indices. Our particular approach, as Julia mentioned, is to really look at human behavior. So it's, it's important to listen to what people say, but also to really watch what they do and to say, is this place, this part of the city, is it inviting for all the people that we expect to see? You know, I mean, if, if everyone here is saying they're happy, that's great. Let's actually look at who's here and see if that it represents everyone. That's tremendously important what Bob Lane's saying here, and I think maybe that comes back to the core of the practice, this idea of measuring, actually going out and look, because people might not actually be doing what they say. So it's very interesting to compare, and it's good to have a range of evidence, but just interviewing people and asking if they're happy is not the same necessarily as going out and seeing what they're doing, and like, what are they actually doing, and that's why I think it's really important, but maybe what makes it a little bit different from just interviewing people, we're very concerned of going out to the public speaking, what's actually going on? What are people doing? Are they using the space? Are you know, are they using their gardens, their yards? Are they out of the streets? Are the kids playing? And there's such a broad range of interests we can look at which actually is real empirical evidence what people actually do. And sometimes people are really pretty surprised because they don't know how much they use spaces and places. 
So I think this is a, maybe a key part of what we use to go out and actually look and see what are people doing. And I guess uh, I mean, the guy, the guy, the guy in the state is going to tell you about that technique or that approach, which has come from Copenhagen. And I think, to be honest, I think it's, it's developed much further in the U.S. as being kind of this need, you know, measuring and watching, observing. I think it's you developed that quite more tools in the U.S. now than we than we have in Copenhagen. So it'd be nice to hear from you guys how, how you use those tools to see our people behaving happily. Maybe I might add healthily because I'm kind of maybe I feel healthy is also maybe a, a cousin of happiness. Mm -hmm. I think um, you're right, David. We're constantly trying to ev evolve and grow the methodology to better be able to capture data on these things we care about, but are very soft and hard to measure. Um, and I think these happiness indices are are welcome in that they reframe the debate about what success actually looks like in a city and help city leaders say, okay, we have to look at more than just our GDP and the financial return on investment. We have to look at these values we care about, happiness being one of them. I think um, you know what's challenging about these and, and problematic, as Blaine was saying, is, is when they start to get very uniform and homogenous. And I think for us, uh, something we're always wondering is, you know, okay, if you reframe it, you still have to understand why are you measuring this way and what are you using the data for? And if you're changing the question to be about happiness, but you're still using the data to just increase property values and um, have financial impacts, then maybe it's not actually so different than an economic index. But if you're to understand all those things David was talking about, where people spend time, where they interact socially, where they feel good, feel a sense of belonging or inclusion, and you're using that data to actually inform design changes, policy changes that can improve people's quality of life, then I think they can be very valuable. But as you know, your exhibit and the essay you shared with us pointed out, that's not necessarily how they're being used right now. Adding, adding to what uh, you just said, Julia, I think there's something that about the arrival of these indices that is uh, closely related to one of the elements of our agenda and what we try to advance, and it's a shift in, on in the, well, A, we believe that indicators are really valuable and very helpful to have, and we are uh, very uh, politically driven to help shift the nature of the indicator to, from the infrastructure to the effect of the infrastructure on the individual. So rather than um, a traditional indicator may look at the amount, the number of square meters of public space by resident, we're more interested in, in the effect of that public space in people. So we may want to know uh, how much those public spaces are being used. And, and we believe that indicators that are closer to the behavior and that are closer to the human effect of infrastructure are more helpful than indicators that are describing the physical elements that are enabling the activities. Yeah, I just, uh, one, one other thought as you were talking that, that came up is this idea of cities competing with each other is this thing that as, as we become increasing like more and more urban uh, that we're seeing kind of cities competing for talent, cities co competing for prestige, for economic vitality. I think there's something about that that can be really great because it drives cities to be better. There's something also problematic because it displaces us. It's this idea that people will move to whatever is just the, has the highest happiness index. And I think that may be at odds with having a very placed and rooted life that is in, in place and, and is actually about sort of deepening and making better the place that you are. And I'm, I'm not really sure what, if, if that's a problem, mm -hmm. but it, it's, a, it's interesting to me that this, these kind of indices are coming up and almost sort of like driving people to just vote with their feet. And I, I don't know if that's aligned with, with happiness, actually. I don't know if that's something yeah. that's going to make us yeah. happier. Yeah, I, I was going to add, I think, I mean, there's also maybe a philosophical question. Is competition a good thing? I guess more, could we see more a, a culture of cooperation rather than competition? And I think we're seeing maybe some new patterns emerging as, as cities, even across, across different regions, start to cooperate more. Um, it's kind of like maybe a reinterpretation of the historical city state, 
where we can see like Copenhagen, which is a, you know, still a small city by, by North American standards, is now collaborating with other cities even across the border in Sweden to create kind of a region. And there's an, 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 an understanding that actually through cooperation, you get further than actually competing with each other. And I guess this is kind of... I think this point is, is crucially important. Like if we're pitting cities against one another, especially if they're cities in the same region, in the same economic region, like here in the Bay Area, we have lots of cities and we all compete each other and we, it's a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom for tax cuts. It's a race to the bottom for all sorts of, for all sorts of things instead of actually trying to uplift the region as a whole. And I think that's something that's really missing from a city indicator. You know, we had, I think it was like the 2000s, like Ed Glazer, Triumph of the City, we're all thrilled that cities aren't going into bankruptcy, but actually now we have sort of a different problem where cities are an incredible um, scarcity. And it's actually like a, a market failure that we don't create more of these dense, livable, interesting, vibrant places. And so when we're just saying, oh, well, here they are, and we've got to like compete amongst like this scarce amount of cities, like why can't we create more of that fabric and think at a, at a larger scale so it's not like the city against the hinterland and so on? Yeah. David. I think you know, this is really important point. This, this is exactly what, but I think this idea that the, we need to create more. And like, you know, I think often we see that the first places that we create, the first urban places that have this kind of walkability, human scale stuff. And I guess they become completely overdeveloped. And I mean, in, in the Bay Area, it would be like Fisherman's Wharf or something. Uh, New Harvard in Copenhagen, Temple Bar in Dublin, Covent Garden in London. Places where actually, are, actually have some like the qualities of human scale and mix and stuff. Yeah, but so totally overexploited mm -hmm. that they become impossible places to actually uh, have a normal life in. Mm -hmm. And that the next generation of neighborhoods, which are kind of like have that kind of scale and mix, are being kind of eaten up. And this problem of gentrification, which I guess we touch on in this conversation, for me it's a, you know, it's a very hugely loaded question. But should we? not make places better for fear of gentrification. I think that's also just a scary idea, like let's make, let's keep places kind of shitty because that will actually and the, and the idea that just because, you know, really nice places like Copenhagen that have, happen to have like a socialist welfare state are really nice, that we shouldn't also desire that for ourselves, right? That like you have these arguments here in the Bay Area, all over the United States, that nice parks, nice places are, are too nice, that we should actually push them out because they're going to create, you know, gentrification, all these things. Like, no, we all deserve a good life. We, each and every one of us in our own way, in a way that's like resonant with our culture and our place mm -hmm. deserve an excellent quality of life and it's n so yeah. yes well so, something I, I think building on, on what Anna is saying about this this desire of everyone uh, to have a good life I think there's something that is happening in the conversation that we're equating indicators with this like unhealthy competition and I think mm -hmm. there's something about the indicator as a measure of the city quality to itself and accountability mm -hmm. of the government to its own residents so mm -hmm. the question is who is defining the metrics and I think a metric can be an incredible tool for achieving that elevation of the quality of life locally, looking at itself, as long as the indicators are reflective of the values of the people that live in that community. So there's something about the, um, that involvement in the definition of, of what is it that we care about, and then the city and, and the people responsible for running it being accountable to, to improving along the standards as they are locally defined. Because I mean, and if I can just interject, it's not exactly the provision, let's say, of uh, green spaces and parks for residents across the board that is then that which is at fault for pushing others out. It's also those who control the real estate market in certain regards that are responsible for the effect, not allowing the effect of that to be something that becomes exclusionary. So you can't restri restrict yourselves as practitioners or designers from wanting to improve things in the end when you're not necessarily the one responsible or able to control the outcome of it either. I think if I can circle, but in a way you've, I mean, this is really interesting, you've effectively kind of answered the next two, if not three questions <laughs> already uh, between <laughs> yourselves. But um, I mean, I think to circle back to this question of the indexes and who defines the terms of those indexes and who defines effectively what you're trying to answer by setting the indicators themselves. I'm curious to know, I mean, 
as an office, it's clear that you're very self-critical about the use of these kind of metrics um, and how they're applied. But I, I'm wondering if maybe there's, maybe New York would be a good example for this. Like, is there a particular case, let's say the Times Square project or any other project where you really have implemented this kind of process or let's say method of observation rather than questioning? You, you mentioned this idea that you observe what people do rather than you ask them what they do as a way of maybe being even more objective about what you're observing and how to change it. So I'm, I'm curious, rather than speaking kind of more broadly, whether there's a specific project that you could speak to. I think the Times Square project is, is a great example of how data on people's behavior could be used to catalyze major transformation. I think our, across our offices, we have great examples of how that's worked on many different scales and many more community-based scales as well. But in New York, um, you know, we had a data-driven native mayor here, Mayor Bloomberg, um, 10 years ago. There, you know, if, if you were to spend any time in an area, in Times Square, um, you knew in your gut it didn't feel good and you had to walk through the street if you needed to get anywhere. And, um, that was time sensitive and really avoided it. And so while all New Yorkers knew this, nobody had ever collected data on what people were actually doing in, in the space. So Gail led a, a study uh, along Broadway from 59th to Union Square of a few miles and then at major commercial streets across the five boroughs to actually document behavior um, on typical days of the week, um, the entire day, and you know, found things that uh, really helped to build a political case for change. For example, 90% of the activity, and the, the movement activity in Times Square was people walking, but only 10% of the space was for people, the remaining 90% was for vehicles. So there was this total mismatch. And you know, even though you might have, there were anecdotes around that, having the numbers there actually helped put people higher up on the agenda and help also inform what the design change would look like. In this case, it was, it's not really rocket science. It was, let's figure out how to create more space for people. Um, which then led to a series of um, pilot projects that could continue to be used to measure, um, test, and refine, and more data could be collected to see how the spaces were being used and designed to continue to evolve based on, on that. And that would be what we see today, actually, uh, a permanent, permanently designed plaza um, that has made the space much better. But I actually think. The New York story should not be open, and it, it is Times Square is still suffering from its own success and is yeah. still completely congested. And you know, I I would hope that the leadership in New York could continue to take this people first approach to continue studying how people are using these major uh, public areas and figure out how they can build out a larger network of public spaces beyond this one flagship project. Yeah. Yeah, if I could just jump in on the end there, I mean, that's exactly what it's about. It's the same problem. There are there just aren't enough nice places. <laughs> and I think what we proved with the, in, in Times Square was actually we made it like a really fun, cool place to hang out with very cheap interventions. And I guess that well, I mean, there's now a much uh, a much refined version of, of, of Times Square, very highly designed, with very high quality materials. Uh, that's very beautiful. But there is another philosophical question: Could we have spent that money and made 50 more cheap projects, which would actually work but just well for more people? So there's a question, you know, of like you know, keeping keeping the ball rolling and then making more places. And what would be really great would be if we were in a situation where all the streets were nice. You know, you know and like, that there wasn't like a, like a bad place. Um, I, I, Julia? It does have the, plaza, the New York City Plaza program, which I think aims to do what you're, what you're saying, but the resources behind it are different than those for Square. Yeah. But um, just, you know, as, I, I won't get into the details of this program that's used to create smaller neighborhood plazas around the five boroughs. But it, it is something Gail has been really interested in. And we did a project a few years ago with the city college here 
to actually evaluate how those spaces were being used and beyond you know their impact on local economy, but to really understand what what kind of social connections and sense of inclusion they were helping to foster in in neighborhoods, often ones with um, high rates of immigrant population and flowing. And yeah. the companies were great, and I think being able to show how well these very these small uh, streets of three with very few resources, how, how they could impact so many people, um, I would like to think helped to bolster that program. I mean, Julia, one of the metrics that I think is, is most compelling out of the Plaza program analysis is how the, these small, cheap, cheaper plazas, as David, David mentioned, what their effect was for people who made less money. And you know, it turns out that for people who were making $50,000 a year or less, those plazas actually had a measurable effect in connecting neighbors to neighbors. So these are like that's a thing that maybe it doesn't get reported on directly as happiness or well-being, but it's something that we can measure. And we actually just know because we're people, we know that being connected to our neighbors generally is a good thing, makes us feel better. If we see that a public space is doing that, that's a great thing to measure. And that actually the incremental, the, the sort of marginal value of investment for for lower income neighborhoods on a public luxury like that is way more beneficial, actually, and maybe in a sort of a deeper level uh, supporting well-being than maybe something like Times Square, which frankly is a place that a lot of people now choose to avoid again because mm -hmm. it's a happiness moment in the sense of it's an Instagram moment. It's, a, it's like a get in, show that you were there and get out moment, mm -hmm. which is like not actually happiness really at a sort of sustained level. Yeah, I, I want to make a point, you know, thinking about like how we get places like Times Square and um, I, I sort of feel like something that has happened in the urban planning process that this happiness agenda has been sort of co-opted by deliberative planning, that sort of discursive planning. Like I ask you what you want. You've seen Times Square. You say, I want that. You point at the photo. You like put your dot on the Times Square image. And so like that's what you get when actually, you know, when you look at what people truly like, oftentimes it's the small little pocket park that is their favorite place. You know, there's pl a place here in San Francisco, the developer asked what people wanted. They said they want a big lawn because they thought that would be nice. When actually, then no one uses the lawn. Everyone uses the little <laughs> strip of asphalt where they walk their dogs and they can actually meet their neighbors. So I think we know this from like studying happiness that it's actually human connection that makes us happy. And you know, it's, it's important to use data to tell the story about how people actually vote with their feet. I mean, I think this goes back to what Blaine was talking about, about the competitive city as a, obviously it's a market ideal. Um, but also the sense in which, you know, these sort of small parks in the five boroughs in New York are not the thing that's going to be reported on because those are not really posited as desirable destinations anyway, right? They're mostly, with any luck, that planning is done for locals. I think it's like a later question around the smart city. And, you know, we're all curious about how technology has a role to play in all of this. And obviously we're measuring all of this um, information about how we move around the city. Um, but I think that what, what Blaine is talking about around, you know, the sort of Instagramification of our public spaces is very dangerous. Um, you know, we've seen what the commodification of our attention has done to the digital sphere. And I think we're all extremely supportive of using data to make objective decisions about our built environment, but very worried of the commodification of our attention in our public sphere. This is a very special place for human beings. It's our natural habitat. And an, it, it's my opinion that it's really important to keep that sort of commodification out of how we design our public spaces. Yeah, because I think the danger there is what, what you know, Instagramification does is it gets it back to, a, to an image and a thing rather than a, an experience and a behavior. And I, it's just, it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, I think measuring experience and behavior is, is more important than measuring things and images. So if you just, if you find yourself measuring things and images or, you, or any of these, these indices start becoming more about that, that's, a, that's kind of a warning sign to rethink what we're, what we're measuring. And so um, experience is really tough to quantify it's super, you know, it's subjective and it's, it's like particular and it's different in every place. Uh, but I don't think there's a shortcut to it really. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we, Gail's particular shortcut is we watch what people do because it turns out that 
if people are very bad liars at at you know uh, spending time in places that they really don't like, like they don't they don't do it. So we we watch that, and that's that's a good way to to really understand that experience. Uh, I, what I wonder was, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering, is there like another? Are we talking about a kind of more of old school kind of culture, or is it like more like the Chinese culture, where you know, like the for you, David. Um, so one of the critiques of the sort of livability indices is that they flatten experience. Like, there's sort of the flatne- flatness of experience. I can go to a hip coffee cafe in Berlin, and it looks exactly the same, the same Edison lights, the same white tiles as I can get in here in San Francisco. And so this sort of like... I only go to those places. This, I, I, I don't feel comfortable in other spots. It's true. And some people do, right? Like, they the sort of... Um, yeah, like this sort of, like utopia, this no place. Yeah. H- how do you think the soft city is different and, and allows for yeah. distinction and differentiation? Well, I guess it's a really, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And, and, and I would like, you know, we work all over the world together. We have this experience with other places. What I'm so aware of is that I guess the people who are like, like that, that time Stockholm or Copenhagen, like, you know, almost exactly the same life as the downtown San Francisco, it's kind of, it's kind of like, there are these pockets, I think one of the biggest, um, the worrying things in the planet at the moment is this, it's not so much the difference between different countries, but actually within countries, we have the people like the, the winners who've chosen our urban life, and the losers are going to have a suburban, semi-rural life. I see the same patterns, I think people who live in the suburbs of Stockholm, probably have a lot in common with the people who live in the suburbs of San Francisco, or Denmark, or some suburbs of, of Melbourne, if that's, and, and that, that's a, a scary development. I mean, some people have picked up on it, this is a nice way to live your life, living in a small apartment, you have a different kind of economy to buy a more expensive apartment, but you save money in your everyday because you don't need a car. That'd be the most valuable resource is time, because you're, 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 you can be so close to this proximity to stuff. And then these people have been sold this raw, they were told this kind of American dream, which to be honest, is everywhere, it's not just America. I mean, many Swedes, many Australians, uh, many Poles have the American dream as well, like uh, of a detached house, with a big garden, having three cars. But you suddenly get there and you discover it's like a, you're trapped. You're trapped in the system. So I think for me, there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a constantly that it's not, it's, it's, yeah, there's the same extra places, but actually 
it's on a different level. Uh, it, it, people in different ways in that matter, it's reflected in politics as well. And, and, and you can see that the people voting for a certain right wing agendas have very similar rights, whether they're in Sweden, whether they're in Australia, whether they're in the US. And I, and I read somewhere that actually you could put down to proximity, but the further you live from your neighbor, the more likely you are to support a right wing agenda. <laughs> um, just, so there's something about being closer to each other actually makes us more tolerant. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's also maybe you know, this more wholesome, deeper kind of, uh, of happiness that we're actually happy with the world around us. I, which I think is important, especially in the Bay Area context, which is that sometimes we equate happiness with like this dopamine rush, this like in, in momentary happiness. Like I scroll through Instagram, I am happy, but does it give me like fulfillment? And actually these moments of friction and of surprise, of moments when we're taken by surprise and we're delighted. Like, you know, when we think of like, I don't know, like, what is love? Like, we love our partners, and, like, we love our partners in the moments when they surprise us in amazing ways, and they, and they bring us happiness, not always in the ways that they're, we know them, but in the ways that we don't know them. I, I want to just, like, challenge this idea, though, <laughs> that, that we're, like, that, some, that, that actually some, like, tolerant, dense city life uh, is is delivering happiness more efficient. I think it delivers hap maybe happiness or well-being with fewer social costs and, lo and longer-term sustainability. I, I think it's problematic, though, that there is another way to deliver happiness that's very individual-focused and, and, and well-being and sort of satisfaction that's very individually focused, has a super high cost, but can be delivered in a totally different way. And, and I think it's I think it's 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 sort of difficult and problematic to say. And I, I don't, David, I mean, I I totally am on page with you about most of what you said. But I think to say that you know um, people are less happy. I mean, people actually in the country report some like higher happiness as a way maybe because urbanites are easy, you know we sometimes like complain more maybe about things. But I, I, you know what I mean? I think I think there's a cost to that. It's like a broad brush there. Of course, this is, that was an incredibly broad statement I was making. Just we see similar kinds of patterns. Um, I also I know when I was researching and working on the book, I think my next book is probably going to be about the suburbs because I also had a lot of happiness in the suburbs. And also, but like 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 what gives people uh, you know, a good life with their neighbours and like you know, the quality of life that comes from being able to have silence and having that space to do stuff and having space to have a dog or. A, Having a backyard, I mean, there, are, there are many things which contribute to a full life. And so I think it, it, um, it, it's true. I think there's something maybe about me, you touched on it, maybe it's an ugly word, efficiency. Um, and I guess where we kind of, maybe in the, in the Nordic context where we have a welfare state, and we actually do very quickly equate things to a kind of a measurable of what they cost. Because we're delivering healthcare, we're delivering home, we're, we're delivering stuff at a price through taxation. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we're more willing to that fast happiness. And we're not thinking at all about this individual, what's my dream? How do I want to live my life? And what are those magic moments? So I think maybe there's a danger as well of taking these, this Nordic perspective and applying it to, to, to a wider context. With but uh, but I, think you, you hit, uh, I think you just hit on the thing, which is that there's actually these qualities of, of sort of suburban happiness which can be that can be delivered and created in the city as well, and you know there are yeah. things like peace, like the thing that people want to live in a in a cul-de-sac because it is a connection with their neighbors. Actually, those things have yeah. their uh, way ways to be in in the city. Well, I think I think part of what we're talking, I think there's like one component that is that makes what David said true and what you said true, but that we're not addressing directly is what type of urban environment or what type of condition makes it easier for you to stay connected and have deep uh, relationships with friends and family and to see them regularly. And there are certain conditions in which the city enables that because you can come into contact with people on a regular basis. But then there's other ways in which living in the, this rural life and you're moving less and, and, and you have people, the, you have the, the passage of time and multiple generations that have been rooted in that place and that also gives you joy. I think this, this um, I think the missing piece here is, is that element of migration. And when you migrate and when you leave your household, when you leave that community, if, or, or at, at the moment in which a family member moves to a new place, 
which of the two places is going to make it easier to foster new connections? And I, I think something that, that we know is that if you don't know anyone, moving to a denser, more diverse environment where you have proximity and access can make that insertion and that creation of new links easier mm -hmm. than moving to a place that is a little bit more homogeneous in terms of mixed use and more spread out. So there's, something, there's a difference between the connections that you already have and that arrival to a new mm -hmm. place and, and what uh, type of architecture, what type of ur urban design can, can ease your mm -hmm. generation of new links. Yeah. Also, transportation. Like, if you look at moments when people, I think we're talking, we're, we're urban designers and architects and landscape architects, but when we think about the moments when we have those connections with people that are across difference, oftentimes they happen in moments of compression, whether it's on a, the compression on a sidewalk or the compression in a train car. And there's some really interesting studies that show, you know, these like regular. Um, exposure to people that are different from you, mm -hmm. often in a transportation environment, actually creates tolerance and all these things that, mm -hmm. that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, intimacy, uh, there's something about those highly sensory experiences, which are sort of a biological happiness when our senses are, where I mean, human beings are both sensory animals and social animals. So when we use all our senses, when we touch and smell and see and feel that it's multi-sensory experiences which are much more common in smaller more intimate spaces as are our social encounters in terms of getting eye contact with people getting closer so i think we should start also touching on some maybe more measurable aspects of um, of, of, of physical or biological happiness which come through sensory and social exposure what i just wanted to add was where um where anna left off which is that one of the things we're trying to do with when we were getting involved in designing new places, is trying to take the qualities of the suburbs, things like your own front yard, which could be smaller than the notion of a front yard or a front porch, your own front door, a place to put your bike, your kids walking to school, the kind of the things people move to the suburbs for. There's no reason why you can't get those things in a city environment as well. Mm. You've both, or this comparison between Nordic context and the United States, you've been talking a lot about, let's say, the role of government and what you expect from institutions. And I'm curious to know uh, how this relates to your clients also, because, and also what it is as a design office that you actually have the power to affect. Like this kind of question of whether there's Edison lights and white subway tiles and all the cafes surrounding your public spaces is not actually something that you can control. Um, and so, but I'm wondering if in Nordic context you're working more with institutions and governments, in American context are you working more with developers or private clients or not in fact? Is, it, is there a kind of equality across the board there? Well, I can't give you an exact number, but I think actually in all of the offices we actually work across the board. And I think one of the roles that Gail's trying to have is also to be a bridge builder. Mm -hmm. um, we call ourselves uh, pragmatic idealists. And I guess there's something to do with, like, there is a reality of the private sector, things to do with the market, market forces, buying stuff. But there's also stuff to do with the public sector, um, to do with politics, to whoever the mayor is, you know, politicians. And we're kind of surfing that all the time. We're kind of surfing these two different things, trying to build a bridge between the public and private sector. And actually, the way Gail's worked, he's actually recruited both from public and private sector. And actually, even the Gail career path, like my former partner here in Copenhagen, she's left the part of private practice, she's now city architect in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And so we see ourselves very much as bridge builders between mm -hmm. these two worlds. And also, and, and, and maybe there's a bigger private element in, in, uh, in the Nordic countries than we think. There's going to be an understanding of this is what the state is good at, this is what the city is good at, and this is what the private sector is good at. And there's maybe more comfort about you know, going back and forth between mm -hmm. those things. But again, I think it would be interesting to put my a U.S. colleagues comment on that, um, and, and because I think that they, they've seen a bit of both as well, and they have that challenge of translating the, 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 this kind of Gale approach to, to the U.S. context. Mm -hmm. But I think for us in, in, in the Nordics, we actually bridge between both things, mm -hmm. and I think we're comfortable in both worlds. Uh, and I, uh, one component I'd like to add, and I, I agree with David, we do work in, in both regions, both with government and private sector, but it's also not limited to the U.S and our work in Europe. We also do a fair amount of work in Latin America, 
And I think we, we also, uh, and in that context, we're also work both for private sector and for governments. And you were asking a little bit about the difference in the expectation of the role of government in the different regions where we work. I would say there's a constant question for our work in uh, developing countries, in particular in Latin America, is that it doesn't matter what we're doing, as long as it's a government, there's a question of our work needs to be helping advance or, or bridge equity because the differences in socioeconomic conditions are so extreme. So I would say our public sector work in Latin America, there's always a, a, thre a thread of are we doing investments in public space that can help uh, advance uh, an equity agenda? I, I think in other contexts, uh, the agenda may be more, could be more linked to economic development or there, there may be other values, but that is one that is always present in, in the Latin America. Well, I, I, I think it, your question seemed like it's, you know, what's, is, can Gail possibly have a hope of changing the underlying political or economic conditions that generate city form? And of course not. I mean, that's, that's like a much bigger thing than, than any one organization can really change. I actually think that where we make the most difference is in the story that we tell. And it sort of doesn't matter who we're telling the story to. And as David Meyer mentioned, we're, we're like developing that story in the public sector, private sector, and, and with sort of residents, you know, public at large. So the, the, the narrative that we have about what a city is for and what we're trying to create together is what we're, what we're working in. And we, um, we hope that then the market and the the government system will sort of cooperate and, and get uh, involved in that story. I would say, right, across offices and across continents where we work, our goal is to empower people who have the, lead, the leadership and the, you know, the role in shaping a city to do that in a people-first way and to really drive the city-making policy and design change process by first focusing on the life of a place and who's there and what are they doing and asking you know what kind of experiences that we're really trying to create and allowing form to follow that um, the answer to those questions and whatever the public life data shows rather than how it's so often we practice in the context in particular with form coming first, and then this expectation life should follow. So no matter the sector, I think that's what we're trying to do. And I wanted to share the example of um, the Office of Public Life in West Palm Beach, Florida, a small municipality where we've been working for a number of years and helped create a new position in the mayor's office of an officer of public life. His role it is is to actually work with the agents, all of the agencies that touch on projects related to the public realm, and help to ensure they are driven with uh, by an understanding of the, the public life in, a, in the place, have defined success metrics that are formed by the community input, and then can actually <laughs> over time to to see you know how how they're addressing those. Yeah, just to just to build on what these guys are talking about, you know, sometimes we we do we do design work, we do pilot projects, but we often talk about our work as a communications project with a physical component. So even if you're doing a pilot project, um, working with a community to design something that's physical, um, you know, so much of the work that goes into it is actually talking, you know, the conversations that happen and the, the message that you're putting out about the life that you want to have. So picking up on this. Uh idea of traveling and translating, as David said, the original concepts conceived by, by Jan and Ingrid in Copenhagen. Uh, maybe it's a good moment to talk about the, the growth of the firm and, and how you've located yourself in different geographies and how you bring the Nordic way of thinking or adapt it to different uh, clients and, and, and contexts. But then also how those clients in different contexts feed back on also shifting and changing maybe the original premises. Sure. I, I mean, I think it, it, we're, we're not necessarily in the business of bringing the Nordic way of thinking to, to other places. It's, it's, uh, it, we're, 
we're bringing a human-centered way of thinking that just happens to be very common or more common in, in Nordic countries. It's certainly part of the DNA of the, of the organization, but it's changed as we've grown. And, and I think the, what we, you know, each office sort of brings its own um, piece to the, to the family now. And when we started the office in San Francisco uh, five years ago, our, our kind of history together was much more in kind of um, tactical urbanism and piloting and trying things at, at scale in public space. And that has shaped the practice now. It's something that we, we do much more of the kind of a measure, test, refine approach as part of our, um, as part of our practice. And um, I'll let Julia talk about, you know, New York is different as, as well. So what we're, what we're doing is really building a practice through kind of anchor cities that actually have something to, to teach the world. Each city is different. And, and so every, every city is adding its, its DNA to the practice now. And we're, we're now kind of making um, a, a strategic effort to grow in China, um, where we have done a lot of work uh, in the last 10 years, and we're going to be doing much more going forward. Um, we have a history of doing work in, in um, uh, uh, Oceania, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and we're going we're gonna to grow that practice. So these are places that can kind of become pattern cities within within our practice and inform um, the other offices. Yeah, and I think so, yeah, agreeing with, with Blaine that it's not about necessarily exporting a, a Nordic product and, and replicating around the world. I think there's something about the beginning of the practice and that is where why we can work in so many different geographies is that our subject, what we are about is uh, the human. And humans, regardless of climate, geography, and culture, have certain aspects that are common. There's something about our physical body, our dimension, our skills, our senses, that is the same if you are in Patagonia than if you are in Papua New Guinea or any other part of the world. We're trying to design and make sure that the city is working for that human body. Now, how the application of, of, of those ideas of designing for people, designing for human comfort and to make the, the built environment comfortable, it lands in really different socioeconomic, cultural, political contexts and the ways how, how those ideas can become, uh, uh, can, can enter reality and be conceived into, into projects, it does take a lot of, of adaptation and communication in a way that is sensitive to that uh, context. So, Context is always something that is, is complementing a base that is, is human-centered and, and just drawing on those components that we, that we share. I'll say something that has really changed with our practice since starting here in the United States. I think this, you know, we are a much more diverse country than, than Denmark. So we've had to adapt our methods of studying public life to consider racial diversity, to consider the, some more of the differences between people. I mean, everything that Myra said is true. We all share the same basic you know, abilities and limitations of a human animal. And there are things that are in our history, especially in the United States, that mean that we need to study racial difference and, and other types of differences between us. Um, which has really, you know, we've, we've changed in this, pra- in this practice and we've actually grown new methods of measuring um, social mixing, diversity in public space um, that have actually, you know, filtered out through the rest of the practice. So that's been really interesting to see. Yeah, I was going to add to that with, you know, like one of the uh, fundamental tools that we use in the practice is something called the 12 quality criteria. And this touches on the universal um, Characteristics of, of that, that we all share that you know we need to be comfortable, we need to feel safe, uh, to really be happy in a place, we need to feel some sense of delight. Um, but you know, as as the San Francisco team pointed out, what that looks like in incredibly diverse U.S. context and Latin American context is very different. And I think you know. One thing that's been exciting about having the practice work more in these more diverse cities is spend a lot of time working with local communities to figure out what what does this mean in your own words and in your city and what 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 a successful new plaza look like to you or a new streetscape plan look like to you and actually try to reframe the conversation around success um, in a more local way. 
Yeah, so um, we've already touched on this a little bit, um, but uh, as we've been studying happiness, um, and like you said, with the, the 12 qualities, uh, there's this like multi-dimensional aspect to the uh, definition and measurement of happiness. Um, sustainability um, and environment being one of them. And um, we looked at Copenhagen in the exhibition. We also looked at Tampa, Florida, which is um, the first well-certified uh, city or neighborhood um, in the world. And I was just wondering what um, the history of, uh, the, of Gale Office's um, sort of like interactions or use with um, systems like LEED and um, how it will interact with um, um, sort of certification systems like WELL. I think more, more than the, the office is made of, of people and those people are bringing a range of different backgrounds and experiences so a lot of our team has had a background in sustainability and experience with those uh, rating systems that are more based on, on the impact of the built environment on, on energy, water, waste management. So, so I think that, that background lies within the office. Our focus as a practice is to complement this um, set of measures which are very well um, addressed by a number of other, other groups and engineering firms. What we want to make sure is that we're not losing the human in, in development and that we're not losing that, that focus on people. So it is part of, of what we know and what is, is part of what makes a good project is we have to look at all these components together, but our main priority is addressing that human dimension. And one of the challenges with, with those systems uh, is that there you can you know, rate a building highly with lead, but it can be right in the middle of nowhere. You have to drive, you know, two hours to get there. And oftentimes our challenge, we take as our challenge, to sort of bring new actors together to have conversations about the life that we want to live in our city. Um, and so that means, you know, going from like building to building and all the different agencies in between, forestry, water, Department of Public Works, public health, um, and all, all the different people that make our public realm run. Um, so that we're not sort of siloing, you know, an, an agency or a, a way of working um, with a certain type of, you know, rating system, sort of limiting. Yeah, and I, I think one one risk we run with any certification system is that it could become a checklist and a checkbox that you you mark and then think you're done. And I think the another, you know element of, of the way we work and try to instill in with our partners is that you really can never be done and if you really want to make sure people are happy and you're facilitating great experiences in a place, we have to constantly be looking at how things are changing and how designs need to be evolving and be flexible to changing demographics, uh, you know, changing climate, uh, a whole range of things. So, you know, I think the well system is, is good for reframing the conversation and saying we have to look more holistically at places, but I, I think a challenge, especially with the funding and you know, climate we have, is how do you really look at this thing, something like this in the long term? Yeah, so similarly, um, we have found um, the, the sort of like happiness movement has been um, super intertwined with uh, the sort of movement for smart cities. And I'm wondering um, how Gale, which has this um, history of, of measurement, um, is um, sort of using um, new kinds of technologies um, and uh, to what degree or, or why not? Yeah, I, th I think that the smart city movement is something that we're kind of often at the edge of because of the data thing. And so there's kind of an expectation that um, human-centered data is going to be just one more layer in the GIS map that's going to allow for um, rational central control in this like outcome that's going to be great for everybody. and. I think there's different. There's probably going to be different perspectives at this at, at Gale, but 
uh, my, mine is that that's really that's a flawed modernist kind of technocratic uh, ideal that is it's a it's a it's a 20th century ideal that sort of moved snuck into the 21st century because now we have lots of sensors so we should just kind of be pretty careful about thinking that anything can be centrally managed uh, super rationally and just try and keep it maybe a little bit simpler and a little bit uh, dumber that, you know, as human beings, we know what makes us happy mm-hmm. and let's, let's align our values and like open our eyes, measure what we need to, but actually like measuring more is not going to necessarily get us there. Like being really clear on what we're trying to achieve at a human level is going to be much more useful than just having kind of more data. So, um, like, I would rather have somebody, uh, you know, a, a city employee standing on a street corner watching, really carefully watching what's going on with, with, the, with the moms and the grandparents with their, with their strollers and, and watching people, how they cross the street and seeing, like, where, where folks are sleeping on the sidewalk than I would like to have any of that information in a computer somewhere in a, in, on a map. Totally agree. I think, well, and... There is something about the type of data that we collect that is really important, and it gets into what Blaine is saying, is that there, there are certain aspects of, of the data that we gather that are really difficult for a, a machine to automate. So when we're looking and analyzing what, how people use public space, it's not only how many people, which is something easier to get with a sensor. We're also looking at what what are they doing, who are they in terms of, of demographics. Is that, that I think a... a a softer layer of, of what is the nature of that activity that we think is uh, you get much richer information when you gather with a human. That being said, and with all the caveats and all the apprehension that we have of, of moving towards a completely automated, we do complement our in-person data collections. We're looking more and more into obtaining what is simple to quantify in a through the use of, sen- of sensors so that we can have bigger sample sizes and, and understand certain patterns with a, a greater level of statistical accuracy than what we can do with an in-person count. So we, we incorporate cautiously without replacing the richness of in-person qualitative information. I mean, surely that would also only enrich the study insofar as like establishing a comparison between what you observe which is full of your own subjectivities also with kind of more anonymous, let's say, data sets that might represent, might represent something other than what you see. And you're also then forced to find a conclusion within that, I would imagine. That's not a question. That's just an observation. <laughs> no, it's we're, true. We're, I mean, we're, we're always, with all this smart city stuff, you know, autonomous vehicles, data collection, like we think that we talk about it like it's this new precipice of human abilities when actually mostly what we're doing is replicating the mistakes of the past. Like, what are we doing with autonomous vehicles for the most part? We're replicating this auto-centric idea of the purpose of our public realm. What are we doing with big data? We're, we have like selection bias and we're just counting the people who have cell phones and we you know, count the people who have cell phones and where they go. And you know, it's not oftentimes giving us new information about the stuff that really matters. Um, and so always we're trying to like shift the focus back to that. Yeah, that said, we're not Luddites. I mean, we're, we're always trying to get, get, the, get the data, you know, we're trying to get, get data wherever we can and, and to make it easier. So I think there's kind of, you know, there's a, there's a balance between just keeping it simple and human and saying the thing that everyone can see and having the stack of numbers to prove it. And really the first thing is kind of what matters the most politically, but you, you, you do need to be able to, to prove it too and to look for patterns that you might not see. So yeah, it's, but, it's but both data, and. Like data, like this is, an, this is definitely an art, not a science, right? Like data is as much like a brush stroke as it is like a piece of, piece of information like it's part of our like the tools in our toolbox of you know convincing people to do the right thing according with their values um yeah but we're, it, we're fighting i mean we're, we're also fighting against we're fighting a battle of data firepower um where the let's let's say the the, the side that has been sort of focused on measuring things not people has had way more um way more firepower for many many years so you sort of have to fight data with data, right? I mean, yeah. you have to get, like, 
information about um, the softer things in order to just counterbalance this enormous weight of data that there is about stuff that is about like car movement or you know energy efficiency or all the other things that are like easier to measure. So it's it's a it's a, a more of a political question about like how you value different sources of data too. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's about the ability to attach outcomes to numbers as well when you're trying to talk to clients or talk to cities, the ability to say this number of thing can save you this much money and it's difficult to hypothesize that without yeah without kind of numbers to be able to make an argument in many cases. At least that's what uh, oftentimes I think what people are looking for, let's say, which is where the push, the push, as you're saying about this kind of enormous weight of data, I think that push comes from the expectations of a lot of people of what's going to come from the investment in a project, let's say. But we are also very critical of this technocratic way of approaching the, the question of happiness, but then on the other end, we have this very loose, subjective way of projecting an idealized image in a very commercial way as the, like, like lifestyle magazines might do in, in circulating these lists of uh, happiest cities. So in between the way of communicating with hard numbers and, and killing people with data, and then these um, kind of soft, naive images that are projected from in, in the way that cities are branded today, let's say. Um, how, how, do you, how do you reconcile those as designers? Like what, how, what language do you then um, use to, to balance between those? We don't think it's for, for us, it's important to help people get a change of mindset and a change of heart and numbers alone and just statistics don't change heart so we usually i think we, we lean towards the numbers are a complement and and they help a story that has to be in frame in terms of, of what is a change and and we it's very important for us to speak in terms of what the everyday person or a general audience something that they can relate to their own life and their own experience so yes there is a component of evidence that supports and makes that message stronger but we it's our communication we we strive to make it accessible to make it compelling and to drive change with with that and that requires a softer touch that is not mm -hmm. it's not only facts yeah and i think that the framing that storytelling is part of the of the value that we add i would say part of how we do that is by having shared experiences with people. And for example, um, you know, sometimes data tells you things like you have very low uh, bus ridership in your city, so maybe you should scratch your bus service, which you know, there could be a lot of problems, especially around equity and access by doing something like that. Um, but if you actually get that bus director and transit agency director out riding the bus and experiencing how probably undignified it is in most North American contexts, what the walking to the stop is like, waiting for the bus is like, actually being on the bus, you can change the narrative and the story and also help explain why the data might be as it is. Um, so I, I think for us it's really important and you know again it sounds pretty straightforward is to actually get city leaders out into the spaces that they manage and have them understand from the eye level perspective of the, the users of whatever system it is what the experience is like and that can be more powerful than the data. Yeah, I mean yeah. this gets to I think what what I was ranting about in terms of the smart city, you know, central command, you know, image that that the idea that you're sort of monitoring at a distance or managing at a distance is a, is a, is problematic. So to me this sort of a, it's a pretty simple principle like the things that bring you closer to the experience are the right things. So anything that's about getting out into the space, experiencing the bus with somebody, watching with your own eyes, feeling with your own skin, uh, empathizing with your own heart, like all those things are the right things to get towards. And the data that gets you closer to those things is the right data to collect in general. 
So um, I think it's a, it's a combination. I mean, it, that's our, our job at Gale is to sort of weave this, this cloth of the story, the narrative, like the intuition with the, the facts and the data that, that support it. Um, but we can't ever get sort of too far away from the, the, the immediate experience. And um, it's, it's, it's tricky because um, there's, there's sort of a lot of, uh, there's a lot of data out there to sift through. Going back to this question of like language and David brought up, you know, livability, happiness, <coughs> well-being. Um, I think there's a limitation that we're having this conversation in English. Actually, yeah. there's some languages mm. that that have words for different types of satisfaction and meaning. And mm. there's one that I've come up uh, against in Danish, which I will try to pronounce now, which is something like Hagesvedila. And I'm definitely saying that wrong. And so I, I encountered this this word when we were translating some of these 12 quality criteria that Julia was talking about earlier. Um, in English, they are uh, comfort first, enjoyment second, and something like uh, something like delight. delight at the end. But it's actually not delight. It's hagasvadila, which is um, the word which is about like a deep sense of meaning and fulfillment. Um, it's, it's sometimes described as the value of a thing when the value of money has been removed. And it's something that you experience in, in Denmark, the sort of experience of access, of neighborliness, of like incredible sun when it's cold outside. And I, I think there's more work to be done around just describing what we mean. And, and actually, by having better words, maybe we can design um, better cities. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I'm sure in some part of your exhibition, you know, like the, the, the term, and I was totally going to try not to say this, but like, like arete, you know, like the Greek term for purpose, you know, kind of comes in. And that, I mean, to Greeks, that was, that was what was important to sort of measure, right? It was like the, the purpose of a person or a thing that, you know, a, the, the arete of a glass is to hold water. The purpose of a person is to maybe, you know, raise and nurture other people and, and to be, you know, in community, in, in relationships. Like we, we can define this in other ways than just happiness, and there's there's this kind of like interlockingness of mm -hmm. of purpose and reason for being that's maybe more important to to look at, and actually kind of what a good city gets at a little bit more than than happiness. That's the difference between, uh, yeah. The word we came across was like eudaimonia, it's like deep yeah. long term fulfillment, versus happiness. But the way that the UN even adopted the word happiness for a a sustainable approach to development was was sort of the triggering uh, thing for how why we set off to track how it's used from policymakers to to lifestyle magazines. So I mean, you basically answered the question for us, um, but it's it's very obvious. It's obvious, um, and we've sort of used this as a baseline for all of our other conversations, but. Has the word comfort and happiness come up with your clients? Like, do they ask you for that as a criteria in the project? And it's about storytelling and how you frame the discussion and the narrative. Yeah, I, I would say it's more common that we bring that word to clients and the clients mm -hmm. bringing it to us because we are we're trying to change a practice and change a field that is used to use words that are harder, more measurable, that have to do more with the physical components. And what we're trying to do is to remember that the purpose of all of these things, that we're all these blocks that we're moving around and we're creating and these spaces, ultimately why that people care about that and why people value that has to do with the experiences that we hope they have there. So we, we do bring the word, words that have to do with, with feelings, with emotions, with experiences into a conversation around peop people that are maybe not used to addressing that and, and we think it's a positive way of, of changing the industry and changing the field. Yeah, our clients come to us asking how they can fill more cafe chairs, how they can keep their population healthier, how they can, you know, keep the economy uh, humming. I mean, I think, like, 
the the idea that all of those things actually can boil down to something really humble and comfortable and human and everyday is the that's that's the aha that we're trying to get to most often. If a client came to us with that to start with, I would want to work with them forever. <laughs> <laughs> Still be to figure out what exactly that looks like, right? In that yeah. place, there is still, I think, quite a process around defining uh, the specific there. Mm-hmm. So we wouldn't be out of work yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah. yeah, is that a good place to stop? Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Than